Okay, uh, welcome uh, to another Lived Quality Conversation on the Lived Quality Podcast. Uh, today, I'm uh, privileged to have Robert as my guest. Uh, I, I've known Robert for a very long time, <laughs> almost a decade, probably longer. Um, yeah, Robert is my good friend, and we always meet up and uh, have long conversations about all life topics you know, different, <laughs> you know, different aspects. And um, yeah, so we agreed to have this chat and uh, he's here. So we're going to do this. <laughs> so Robert, how have you been? How have you been doing? And uh, what I've been thinking about? <laughs> well, let me start by just a quick brief about myself. My name is Robert, as you say, um, I'm originally from Uganda and currently living here in Australia, in Brisbane. And yeah, you and I have had numerous conversations over coffee, lunch, which actually most of them have been really eye-opening. And to do this for me is a privilege because sometimes I feel we just have too much that we need to let go out there. So um, I'm really very excited to have a sit down with you and chat. What have I been thinking? Um, Quite a lot. Life generally and, um, you know, self-love, love love for the family, um, work and faith and belief, pretty much everything. It all depends on which side of the bed, you know, I've woken up on. But every day seems to be like a repetitive routine of all the things that I've listed. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, and you know, those are the kind of things we're always talking about. Yeah. I, like I like I've always said, you know, I have this belief that if you speak to someone long enough, you get to you get to the bottom of their wisdom and, and how they apply it. And and I think this is what really we're all about. And and then we get to learn from each other and you know, get to borrow some of each other's tricks and apply them. Uh so yeah, yeah. And, and 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 of late, you know, these are some of the things I was speaking to someone uh, a few days ago, and we were do, we went on this tangent of family, right? Like you've been saying, and we're trying to understand, uh, yeah, can what what is the nature of family these days, and and um, and what are the things people should be sort of like focusing more on, and and you know what what it is that we're doing, and. A very interesting aspect came up whereby it's as if a family is a, a very, it has this job where you're supposed to sort of like, you know, hold a space to allow a person to kind of like show who they really are, irrespective yeah. of, of, of whether you like it or not. It's like, it has to be that space of acceptance. And and so it's like a big job, right? So yeah. it's a very big job. Yeah. <laughs> And what are some of your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, um, that's very interesting because um, if you look back at the time we grew up, you know, like our times of when we grew up, personally speaking, I could, um, I grew up in um, sort of an extended family where um, the essence of, you know, a kid is raised by the village actually was a real example. So um, even though I had my parents um, lost my dad when I was young, but my mom was, you know, she's still there. Um, It felt like a a communal responsibility um, where um, everybody knew everyone's kid. And um, when they call you, they call you with a reference to either your grandfather's, you know, name and stuff like that. And there was some sort of, um, you know, communal responsibility to make sure you are on the right path, you know. Today um, is quite a bit different because of advancement in technology, but also still, again, depending on the the setup, you know, like when you're more like in the urban setup, it's more predominantly like, you know, liberal is more... um, you're doing the best you can for especially your kids to have 
the ma like maximum exposure to so many things from which maybe they can pick one or two things. I personally do believe that, um, um, you know, I think each one of us, when given an opportunity to explore um, outside of what we are known for, we are much better resourceful. Um, and that goes into the thinking that, you know, my wife and I, we have completely two different sides of how we, you know, we raise a family. She is more the quote unquote, the moral compass, you know, for me, um, the other liberal, like, oh, what are you doing? Okay. You know, like poking with questions to see, um, you know, to, to, to let them reflect on either their belief system or um, how they generally, you know, um, look at the world overall, the world around them and the world out there. So it's, it's a very interesting dynamic for me to say the least, really. It's a very interesting dynamic. Yeah, yeah, because, this, you know, like this opportunity you have with them is not endless, right? Like you're not going to, especially like, you know, with children, they grow really fast, right? Like you, before you know it, they're walking, they're talking, they're off to school. Oh my God, they're, they're moving to another level of school and they're starting to work. And then off they go. And so you have, when you look at it uh, retrospectively, you have such a very short period of time in yeah. which to, you know, help them shape a perspective on life. And then, and then whatever you manage to get in there, right? Like <laughs> later on, now they have to live with, carry with them the rest of their life. And so, yeah, yeah I find it quite fascinating because, most of the time we are, we're not paying attention to that. Right. And you, you're sort of like trying to solve for the moment. It's like, ah, oh, I, I just need to get through this moment. Right. Without yeah. thinking of the bigger picture. And yet uh, some of the things like, especially like if, a, you know, a child, like I, I have a, a four year old daughter who now gets lots of uh, tantrums sometimes. Right. Yeah. And if they fall into a tantrum, yeah. it's so easy to get trapped into it. And you yeah. forget that, oh, wait, no, this is a, this is a, this person eventually becomes an adult. So whatever I do in this moment could have like a lifelong impact on them. So, yeah. And, and I think we have to be very cautious with those kinds of scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the, you know, um, I always tell friends that the, our kids are much smarter than we were at their age. And I think part of it is because of the exposure they have, accessibility to certain things that potentially we didn't have, um, you know, social aspect with other kids of different backgrounds, cultures and stuff like that. So, of course, you know, the big giant village, the internet, you know, um, it's, it's shaping our kids to be way smarter in terms of their thinking. And yeah, and sometimes you feel like the time is not enough. Um, and I remember when my, I have a fifth, no, almost 15 year old boy and, and almost 11 year old girl. Sometimes when I look at the pictures, um, you know, five years ago, seven years ago, and I'm looking at the, the persons they have developed to be or they're developing to be, it's, it's just fascinating. I'm like, where have we all been? You know, okay. um, it, it just doesn't feel like we even spent any time. It's, it doesn't feel like you, you go to bed, you wake up and like you have a teenager in the house. Yeah. So, um, so for me, that experience is so rewarding. It's, it's really so good to see them transition into the persons and also having um, their morals question, having to, to think outside the box, have all this exposure they have at their disposal and also sometimes sitting down to see how they reason how you know um yeah it's it's it's, it's a rewarding experience absolutely yeah it is and then they'll go off and then you know now you have to teach them how to <laughs> what to look out for in life right you know yeah. what does it mean to actually how do you approach this monster called life and how do you adjust like you have to teach them almost a lifelong strategy, you know, things yeah. like, oh, how do you manage finance, right? How do you yeah. 
you, you know, you're saying before, like your r- belief, right? Like <laughs> religious beliefs, like how do you constrain that? Should you be constraining it or not? And so it's a, it's a massive job, uh, yeah. this, this parenting gig, hey? <laughs> Yeah. yeah. So um, you had mentioned you had you you wanted to say some things about uh, finance, like you you had wanted to take this in a financial direction. <laughs> so what are some of your thoughts in that area that you've been thinking about recently that you'd like us to explore? I definitely I have a lot uh, of opinions about so many things. Uh, finance is one of them. Um, Faith is another one, so we it can go anywhere. But now that you poke my, you know, my nose on the finance thing, well, my my background um, professionally is um, technology, but then transition into um, entrepreneurship, which is definitely um, running also um, co-running like a fintech company which is um, built on open source. Um, And because it's fintech, financial technology, um, I've had the privilege to be closer to understand how the financial system works. Um, And I'm not not expert at all uh, because I'm continuously learning. I'm continuously learning how things are going, how things, you know, really happen both um, at face value, but also in the back end. Um, I, I do believe that uh, we are in a much better position we were when we were being brought up because the essence of finance um, at the level when we were growing up as kids was really not something that our parents bothered to put us down and you know talk to us through it. It was more like survival for the fittest, like yeah, from the hand to the mouth, so, um, to say. Um, but today, um, when you look at everything around you with massive, massive trove of information, um, you start to understand everything almost revolves around finance, you know, uh, whether it's a common person working to just pay the bills or somebody up there trying to stack up the wealth and then anything in the in in you know everything in the middle is revolving around the day to day hustle to say um mm-hmm. one of the things that i i think a few years ago i learned was to start embedding the thinking of finance into my children so when my first kid was born we started like a very simple, like um, coin jar, like coin jar, like, you know. Um, as it grew, we we started, you know, the, the idea of the coin jar was any spare coin that you have, put it in the jar. So you mm-hmm. come from work, oh, I have some coin here, you, you drop in the coin jar. Um, and as he grew, it became like one, so we started giving it to him to put in the coin jar and then explaining to him um, why we're doing that. What is, um, you know, the rationale behind, um, you know, doing that at, the, at, at one year old. And, you know, as it starts growing and we opened the coin jar when it was three. So mm-hmm. I remember where we went to the bank and opened an account, a toddler's account, you know, with him. Um, telling him this is where that money will now be kept. This money can eventually multiply and give you some interest and stuff like that. It's been over 10 years now. I don't, I don't even know uh, because that was back in Uganda. Um, and then our daughter comes, everything starts moving more digital. So now we don't have coin jar anymore. We, you know, um, the kids... They, they have like an account with a tool called Spreegy. Spreegy is where, um, you know, kids can like save money, pocket money. Um, if they have any, whatever, we put it on, on, on the account. And then that money also has like a savings part, which earns interest. Mm-hmm. So they can actually use the money. Sometimes interesting part for me is 
looking at their statements and sitting down with them to understand mm. how they spend the money, why they spend the money, questioning some of their decisions, and then sitting back to hear their point of view. Mm. I can tell you their point of view was, is more superior than I, I would have articulated at their age. Mm. So, yeah, finance is, is, is part of us. Um, it's not an end to the, you know, a means to an end, but it is predominantly plays a crucial role in our day-to-day -day life and activities. Yeah, it does. And, and you know, hearing you share some of that, you reminded me, you know, of some of also the activities we do here with the children. Um, there's this thing, uh, my eldest, he will, um, we ask him to do chores, right? Like, but he's hired at school that his friends get paid to do chores and so we have to set the rule clear it's like look uh unfortunately for you it's not going to work like that yet uh because we're all participating in the chores you, what you'd be paid to do is your contribution to the whole thing because like we your parents have to go off and earn a living so yeah. you can also have all these other privileges that you get and so yeah. it's part of the contribution in that sense. And so, but I like that, you know, what you share there, especially when they get older, now you, you need to introduce them to uh, a way to actually have some independence and some autonomy around how do they take the finance? How do they, what are they, what choices are they making when they have to spend? Um, yeah. And what are they consuming? Because, sometimes especially like in a cash economy right like you just give a child some yeah. money and you don't really know what they're going to do yeah. and after several months you now start to see the side effects of that and then you go like oh wait considering how much i've been giving you i don't know if you could afford that thing right yeah. did they save up to it did yeah. they find a different way of trading and so all these questions can come up if, you, if it's not something you pay attention to and i think Having such technologies like Spriggy, I think, is very, very helpful in that it aspect is. to sort of like organize it and make it even visible to you, the parent. Yeah. Like you can go back and see the statements, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, what, so uh, we, we actually do that as well, where um, we give them um, like chores and monetize it for them to, to earn something from it. The other, the other time, uh, our loan, you know, if we pay somebody from outside to come and mow it, mm -hmm. um, maybe it would cost forty dollars. So I'm like, hey, you know, speak to my son. We can pay you thirty bucks to mow the loan, and he's mowing it. So like every time it grows up, um, you know, he can mow the loan. But the other thing also, which is very interesting, which we started doing now is okay, I can give you a job and you do it, perhaps maybe pay you something. That's, that's all good, but what if the job runs out? Mm -hmm. How do you think of um, creating maybe a revenue stream, a revenue stream that is going to make you perhaps maybe have a more continuous revenue? So recently, a week ago, my daughter and I, actually maybe a little bit two or three weeks ago, we started thinking of, what would be a revenue stream for her? So what we did, we were like, look, I am, I'm doing great in music. I know the nitty gritties of music. Let's try this AI tool to create music that will be released under you as the artist. Mm -hmm. And eventually they had to take us through a whole masterclass on how you earn money from music, where you put the music, what you need to do. So that was so rewarding, like the, the level of attention she paid. So we started, we started from a scratch, like, you know, how do you create a music? How do you create a piece of music? So I was like, what are you interested in? She's like, I'm interested in meditation kind of thing. I was like, good. So we started, you know, we created 20 tracks that are more towards meditation. And then we went to A, I was like, what name can we give it? It was like, okay, so we asked Chad GPT to give us a list of three names and one of the names stood out for her, which mm -hmm. is Wildscapes uh, Meditation Across the Map. I was like, whoa, that's, that's awesome. So then I was like, what artwork ideas do you have? 
So to see her and I, and I walking through that process until today where we mix and master the music, release the music on DSP, her actually installing the like distribution platform on her phone to actually check how the music was doing. I was like, now you have something, you have some sort of an asset that hopefully will generate revenue for you. If the work runs out, potentially, maybe you can earn from this for a long time. Mm -hmm. It was such a rewarding thing. And these are some of the things that I did not have access to. Mm -hmm. um, because while you are growing up, you're either given pocket money, that's it. So, and now you have to wait for the next time you're going to school to be given pocket money. Um, and today is is different. I think kids are even working like at the age of 15, you know, 16, 17, even if it is more casual work, you know, in a department store or, you know, in um, in a shop somewhere. But they're actually learning the the essence and the grit that is needed for, for them to actually go to the real world and face the workforce. So it's it's interesting. It's very interesting. No, it's, that that's a fascinating example. You know, it reminded me I was watching uh, a clip this morning from uh, a BBC show about AI. I think it aired a couple of days ago, and you know, these presenters are freaking out about you know how AI is is becoming really good. I think they they're trying to sort of mimic uh, what they're calling uh, the the AGI, or, or um, I think. That would be the general intelligence, like ha have this AI that sort of like learns quickly from life yeah. scenarios. And so in the in the demonstration of the clip, uh, they have this robot. Uh, somebody asks, uh, there's an apple in front of it on a plate and and, and a, a dishwashing, a dish drying rack. And um, he... You know, the, the person asks if it can give him something to eat and it offers him an apple. And then he pours some trash on the plate and he asks it to pick up the trash. And while it's doing that, he asks it, why did it give him an apple? And so, you know, it takes some yeah. time. It thinks about it and <laughs> tells him because yeah. it was the only thing edible around that it could yeah. offer him. Um, and so, you know, it does a clean up. And so in the demonstration, they're showing like, oh, you can go from the chat GPT, which you're typing in, and you can actually talk with it. And yeah. and so one of the, and this is a very common outcry these days, people are, are so concerned that the AI is going to rise and it's going to replace being a human. Um, but I think like being a human is such a complex thing that yeah. uh, if the AI even tried to be human, it would quickly reprioritize the kinds of intelligence that it's it's yeah. cultivating right now, and so you quickly find that, uh, you know, the, the example you gave there of you collaborating with your daughter with the AI, it's like it's all going to become yes. like a, another member of society that we work with, and the AI will be good at certain things, but not everything, and so we have to learn to work with the AI. And I think that's the opportunity that, you know, our children and the next generation have that, well, now they, they have a, a, an opportunity, they have a chance to explore more of their creativity as opposed to being trapped in uh, some of the things that they, like us growing up, we couldn't hand off those things to a different yeah. tool or we couldn't get them done faster. And yeah. so for them, you know, they have that opportunity, but again, the, it comes back, you know, the, the, the thing we're speaking about earlier about the family, it's like, yeah, you have to, you now have to shape this reality for them. You have to bring yeah. them into it and sort of like start doing the introduction in a gentle participatory way, kind of like what you've been saying. Yeah. 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 So AI for me, honestly, I, I also believe it's a collaborative tool. It's not a replacement um, because I've actually started a, um, a social media podcast, which is right now only on Instagram, which is going to be diving mostly on like different aspects of AI based on my own interactions. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that stands out very clearly for me is, um, yes, human beings are very complex. To try and repli um, re replicate and reproduce our intelligence into a machine 
I don't want to imagine. But the, the AI will, will look super smart, all we know that. But there are certain aspects of life that no machine will ever reproduce. Um, um, if we only believe that we can collaborate with it, we can use it to even enhance our thinking, maybe, I don't know, X times. I think for me, that is a better place to be than to live in fear that it's coming to replace my job, it's coming to replace my task. Mm -hmm. um, I also believe that when you collaborate with AI, like the tangent of thinking keeps growing and you, you keep going to one thing to the other. And this is something perhaps you would have not even thought of. Um, and I think of it like having another smart person in the room and you pick up something to talk about and then a whole other new world opens up for you to start exploring. Um, you know, when we were working on that album, we learned so much because we start like what we think this is where we want to go. And then we end up completely somewhere else. And for me, I'm like, a lot of the thinking was coming from us, even like what you need to type. You need to think of what, you're not just going to type anything and you think the AI is going to give you the answer. So we need to think through like, what are we looking for? How do we want it? We have never been to this place, but we want to get this fact here. How do we start? Um, and then, then you see the output that gets generated um, and then you have to discuss it and then, you know, deliberate on it. Um, before you come to a consensus that, yes, I think this would work, you know. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's so fascinating. And I know most of the AI thing is still in infant stage, but I think it's going to grow, it's going to become bigger. The, the thing that um, I'm trying to, to do with the closest people closest to me is to, um, you know, have a dialogue, like to understand, like, okay, what is the option? And what are your options? How do you circumvent or retrofit uh, what you do in the context of the reality? Mm -hmm. And how do you look at it from maybe a vantage point of view other than a fear? Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's very interesting. And I also realized that, you know, sometimes my upbringing, educational upbringing was from Uganda. There are so many similarities to what is here, but there's still a, a wide, gap in terms of how the information used to flow, um, how it was given. For example, here, yeah, like, you know, my kids tell me, oh, we have only one teacher. They're teaching science, they're teaching math, they're teaching English. Back home, we would have an English teacher who may not actually know sciences or anything, right? But it's very interesting. So the question is like, um, do you need a teacher for every subject? Oh, can an English teacher now pick up you know, a different domain to still be relevant. Mm -hmm. Maybe with AI, they can actually leverage that to actually speed up their learning capabilities. In that case, shortage of teachers in developing countries, perhaps this could be one of the solutions they can look at. Um, and also there's some vanilla stuff, vanilla stuff that we used to learn. I think as a student of geography back home in Uganda, I used to know almost everything about Switzerland, about mm -hmm. Germany, about some other place, you know. And the question is, um, is that still relevant in the current age? Or can I now use the time to perhaps, to perhaps maybe beef up something different in terms of my knowledge base? These are all things that I think as humans, we need to start questioning ourselves as the reality becomes more real, especially um, with the AI and, you know, the artificial intelligence and all that, yeah. Yeah, and, and I like to say that, you know, growing up, like probably even the generations that came before us, uh, for them, uh, being a human was something that is obvious, right? It's like, you just looked at, you know, especially like us growing up, like in tribal society, right? Like you, you look at your, the person from your tribe and you look at them and you say, yeah, that's a person, right? And every tribe has a definition of what a person is. And so it was like something obvious that you didn't really need to articulate. Uh, but as time is passing, you're now starting to find that 
you know, first of all, the world becomes like a, a global village. And so now the definition of what a person is has all these multiple variations. And then now with things like AI coming up and starting to mimic what humans do. So all of a sudden what we do, what we used to do as uh, something important and repetitive, all of a sudden we now have to find a way to do it in a, a more unique way, in a more distinct way. For example, like, you know, you, you read articles, right? Like I, I like writing articles, but now yeah. uh, if you write something uh, and you give it to chat GPT, Chat GPT can rewrite it and even make it better than what yeah. you wrote before. Yeah. Uh, but then, you, you know, you have to have that ability to see the, 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 the you'd say, how brittle perfection becomes. Right? Like, cause, yeah. like if you read through the thing that's generated by the AI, yeah. it's too perfect. Yeah, right? it's too perfect. <laughs> it's too polish. Yeah, yeah and you, you kind of like, you, you, you kind of need to bring back the impurities, which will make it more humanable. I, like even even like right now we're recording this like the tool i use has some yeah. ai cap capability whereby yeah. you can tell it to edit on a click of a button now it will edit and will give you something but if you go and listen to that or you watch that the, yeah. the version that it edited it took out all the things that it thought were meaningless or did not make sense you know like the the, the pauses the repetitions yeah. uh yeah. You know the places where it thinks like, oh, that, that sounds like it's it's a it's an imperfection. I should I should remove it. And so when you listen to it, it doesn't feel like something that you can relate to. You go like, oh, no, please put back everything you took out, right? Because all these things, all these silences, all these repetitions, they actually mean something. Now, yeah. they yeah. may not mean something to the AI, but they yeah. mean something to other humans. And so for us, when we get together and we kind of like speak in this way, we we understand each other better, but we also validate our authenticity to each other. Yeah. And so, yeah, yeah. I, I, we have to learn to use it. Yeah. Which is interesting because AI, you have to train AI with a data set. <laughs> and their, their, their intelligence will only be limited to the data set. You feed it. But for us, as we grow, as our minds become, you know, our brains develop, we have such humongous amount of data set that we go through, some of which are not like you discover as you go. And that kind of intelligence is, is different. And as you said, AI is perfection. I remember um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a great, um, I love watching football for entertainment value. And I remember when they were introducing, um, you know, uh, VAR. VAR is a virtual assistance referee um, where, um, you know, it's now to perfection if there's an offside. Um, even though as a technologist, I really love the idea like now nobody's going to be cheated. But I still felt like I really love the tension, the, the sadness, the emotion after the game when somebody, you know, with error, a referee makes an error. I love that I'm missing it now. So now everything is perfection. So I'm like, I'm losing my human touch. Yeah. <laughs> as I said, you know, those poses, like AI is not going to take that as something useful, but it's part of the human. It's, it's a tapestry of human, human thing. So you can't take it away. And that's why... Um, we shouldn't really be worried of the AI. I think if you're using AI to edit and like give you a head start to do most of the things and then you can tweak one or two things, you have saved so much time. Yeah. You can reuse that time for something else or something different. And that's how I see it. Yeah, and, and I think what, what, what the challenge of working with AI is, is, is making us face is more like, you know, something you touched on earlier. It's like you have... Like if, if you're going to type into the AI, you have to already know what yeah. you want and you have to know how to articulate that and shape it. And so I yeah. think it's putting us in a position whereby well, we have the opportunity now to cultivate our values more and sort of like refine them and get to a better understanding of what these things that we value are. Uh, like yeah. For example, like the, what, what you would normally call a mistake uh, yeah. is now something we value 
And, yeah. Oh no, that's a, that, that's humanness, right? It's like yeah. when the when the referee makes a mistake, uh, and even if it's unfair, but yeah. that's what makes it special because we can't predict which mistake they are going to make. But if yeah. we can predict all the yeah. possible outcomes, then it's sort of like all the the thing sort of dies for us. It's like, it oh, loses. what are you talking about? So it yeah, loses. it's like. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. You, you see the the dominance. For example, yeah. the these teams like you know a team like uh, in 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 the English Premier League, a team like uh, uh, Manchester City, right? It's like we just get a pile of money, yes. and get get the best people in everything, yeah. And then we we dominate the the sport, and and this this happens, yeah. And so you you find that on top of that, if the technology is also in increasing the perfection and reducing the, the the margin for error then the outcomes are always going to be exactly very predictable, predictable. and so yeah. and so that takes the mystery out of it and and i think the challenge for us as humans is how do we bring the mystery back in right so like yes. how do we how do we make things more meaningful how do we bring things back to life again now that all this automation, all this technological advancement is starting to kill the old version that we yeah. sort of like had learned to work with. Yeah. yeah. So I think um, in my my view, um, probably there are two types of people or recipients of the, um, the AI and technology thing. There is, the, the first category is the one that is still stuck like I want my human part of thing to remain intact without any intrusion. Mm. And there's another category that is saying, well, I still want the aspects of the human thing intact, but also be exposed to learn other things that perhaps was not, or I was not trained, I was, was not embedded into my human thing. Now, the question is, how do you balance the two, right? Because I think if there was such a thing as perfect, a perfect life, you need a fair balance of the, the human emotion, the, the human thing, but also to some extent, a perfect world, if it exists, which I don't think it does. So, but how, how do you sit in the middle where you're like, oh, okay, I think this looks Polish, let me just add some lipstick. Let me just add a couple of things to make it now human. So it still look it looks still quality, but also humanly. Yeah. And and a lot of people are stuck in between. Like no no no, I want it all human. I want it like. And then another, another one is like I, I I want you know I want to mix up the two. So um, it is 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 very interesting that um, you know. As these things are unraveling, we are also learning a lot to adapt to it. Mm. Um, and we will always have skeptics. We are going to always have people who are like, no, I don't want this. Think of it like when internet came, you know, when you talk to our grandfathers, you know, when during their time they didn't have access to some of these things and then there came telephone and then telephone you know, we have internet now, then all of a sudden there are such engines now, but each one of those did not just walk in the door. There were people who were like, no, 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 I still want to do this. I want to, you know, I still want to produce my music by cutting the tapes, you know, I feel it gives me the, the feel to do that. And then a gen another generation comes and like, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> so it's it's a very interesting for me, like to see it develop and transcend across different generations. is It's just a good time to be in. I really love it. Now it's such a great time. You know, recently I had to uh, like install a software update to to the car, and yeah. and I needed to find a, a USB drive. The recommendation was something between eight gigabytes and not more than sixteen gigabytes, right? And so I rock up to the uh, whatever stationary shop, and <laughs> I I try to find the smallest they could, but the smallest was sixteen, right? So, but that was the maximum I was allowed to use. So I was hoping maybe I can find something smaller so that 
you know, I'm not hitting the limit. So I asked the attendant about this and they tell me, no, look, uh, the, that's the smallest size that is made these days. And right next to it, <laughs> right next to the stall where they were, they were selling the USB drives was this box of DVDs, right? And I was looking at this, I'm like, wow, <laughs> we've gone from DVDs to the smallest USB stick being 16 gigabytes. And now you look at DVDs as relics. It's like, wow, how quickly time yeah. shifts, right? Yeah. And, yeah. and it's all through the embracement of, of all this technology, hey? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Um, it's a shift, man. Like, um, it's unbelievable because just yes, um, a couple of days ago, I was having a conversation with my daughter while we were driving. And I asked her, do you know how many windows have been? And she just couldn't understand. I was like, no, the oper operating system windows, the version of windows. So I was like, let's chat GPT and find out. And we started reading through. And I was like, you know where I started? I started with 95. Right now, I've lost track. I don't even know what it is, you know, where it is. So, and I started with floppy, floppy drive, which is 1.4 MB. That's all you get. Not even 16 GB. It's 1.4. So, <laughs> a few text files, you know, you keep in there, you know, you, you spend the whole night writing dissertation and you're saving it on floppy drive. And then the day you're going to print it, right? This is all corrupt. Corrupted. Yeah. <laughs> you know, um, it's, it's interesting. Um, it's, it's really interesting time to live in. <laughs> yeah, it is. And, and speaking of which, you know, you, you reminded me of like, you know, we we're touching it on it just then, like bringing back the mystery. And so like now I'm wondering, it's like with all the, the rays, you know, the, the, the AI rising up. And, and I think that's where you find that, you know, touching on spirituality and, and religiosity, you find that now all of a sudden it's a challenge. You have to work harder, <laughs> right? If, if, you, if you're going to, to, to claim that belief, you actually have to earn it. Now you have to get into the detail. It's not going to be something willy-nilly where you kind of like just believe it at a surface level. Yep. Now you have to get into the details of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, and, and you, you had said you, you have some thoughts on, on, on spirituality. I don't know. What are some of your thoughts in that area? <laughs> That's a very big pool of things, but I will try and maybe share pick a couple of them. Um, so faith and belief for me was a very fundamental thing at a stage in my life. Um, I remember because... My, my family background are not quote unquote religious. You know, my dad and my mom, even when we were kids, never took us to church. So, and um, some period in my life, I had to explore things by my own, right? Um, and so I stumbled on a couple of things. For example, when I was like in grade two. Um, in fact, learning to read, I learned to read in grade one. Uh, but now perfecting my reading was around grade two, which back home is like primary two. Um, and the, the book that actually made me perfect my reading was the Bible. That was the only book available to me at my disposal. So, because I, I wasn't this kid who really embraced school. I was like, yeah, if I don't go, I don't go. If I go, I go. So um, I took like a whole year without going to school, but that one year I learned so much to read. And I was, I wake up every day and I'm reading the Bible. At this point, I'm not even going to church. There was an old, only Old Testament book um, in local language. I read that book from Matthew all the way to Revelation, literally finish it, to an extent where um, I would start narrating a story 
of a character in the Bible like Paul. Paul used to be one of my my really favorite um, characters in the Bible. And my colleagues, my peers, would just look at me like I was crazy. Um, so, and then somehow I was pulled into going to attend services um, and masses, Catholic, and then went into different denominations around there within the Christian circle. And in 2000, that's when um, I just woke up and I went to a guy who used to preach in the village. And I told him, I want to give my life to Christ. He asked me why. I was like, I just want to give my life to Christ. That was in 2000. Um, and he prayed for me. So between 2000 and 2002, 2003, I was very active um, including, you know, doing evangelism, um, doing retreats, doing, um, you know, intercession. Um, a lot of activities happened between 2000 and 2003 when I went to uni. So when I went to uni, um, I, the, my focus, the reality hit me so hard the reality that when I look back, I was the only one from my family to have made it that far. So two things. One, I was the only person to have made it that far. Number two, I was like, there, there is nothing else except the grace of God that has led me here. Those two realizations were very specific to me. So I shifted my um you know in front of the camera to behind the camera mm. to say which means um i reevaluated where my position is going to be in the big picture what could i possibly do to still contribute to the kingdom that was the thinking so i moved from the front all the way to the back even though I was in a choir, I was not really there to sing. I was there to make sure everything we needed to sing very well was taken care of. Mm -hmm. So during the Sunday service, which we used to have in the university in a hall, it's a big hall, I understood quickly that I was going to be more useful in ensuring that I prepare the ground so that other people can thrive. Yeah. So I dissolved slowly behind the scene, making sure the console is working well, the microphone is working well, there is no weird sound coming. So um, during that two-hour Sunday service, I take over the control. Um, and yet there was actually a whole team. So this guy, his name was Kato. I remember very well. When he realized that I was actually doing that, so he would just leave me to run the whole show. And that for me was so rewarding because one, nobody's seeing me in the front, but things are going well. At the same time, I'm now dedicating more time to make sure I study. So because I had this, burden on my heart that if you are the only one from your from your family to have made it this way then you have to make sure you get out of here with something um, and then the other one is like if you can contribute in a way to the kingdom without being in front of the microphone you have to do the very best so i would write skits and direct it and then don't appear in it so I would, um, I would like, you know, during choir practice, correct certain things that are technical stuff, and then nobody sees me at all in front. But then the choir is going, things are going well. And that thinking actually even expanded more since I left. I left, I left uni. One of the significant things that really happened was there was a, a Christian radio station uh, in Kampala, named with hell. Um, every time I'm listening to the, the station, 
something kept telling me like, why are they continuously playing the same songs? How come they cannot have variety of music? So um, I started supplying them with music. So I would go and like every new song. In fact, when other people were thinking of like, um, you know, iTunes at the time, I was already ahead of the game. So I would have all the music, like real music, you know, um, and, and supply them. And then, you know, for me to sit back and hear people calling on the radio station requesting for a song that they had for the first time, it was like joy next level. I was like, that is all I wanted to do, like to be in the, fourth, in the background. Fast forward, um, we move um, and then I started going through a transition. Like um, the transition was more in now understanding a little bit deeper than just the surface. Because background actually gives you so much information that upfront, like, you know, um, I started to see how things work mm. at the church level, at, you know, cell. We used to have like cell level because we used to host the cell in our house. Like to have these people up and close, not when the crowd is there. It's just a small section, like to hear them speak, to understand what they go through. And then my mind started expanding. So from almost a judgmental point of view, like you have to do this or else you're going to hell. My mind shifted more to empathy. And that is the thing that um, I'm very proud of that I've developed. Because I remember you and I had this conversation where we talked about person like a person you know sometimes we get carried out carried away and we do not know that there's a person like if we only think like this is a person i'm talking to clayton clayton is a person other than clayton is you know um is a christian or clayton is atheist or robert is so and so because then that level blind falls us from actually looking at you as a person and for me that conversation was very profound to me. It's one of the um, snippets of growth that have developed. So I have more passion. I have more compassion. I have more empathy, you know, than even, even when, like, I still value that there's a superpower. I still value that um, there's a God. But I'm also understanding that I'm living in a world where not everybody's opinion has to align with mine. Mm. So I'm always poking, I'm always poking conversation. Like when I hear something, I want to know more. I want to like how, like where you're thinking. I remember you, I used to work with this company where you and I worked. Um, and I was in Perth at the time. So having a beer with, uh, with one of my colleagues. And we were talking and then he mentioned something was like, I cannot stand Christians. I cannot stand Christians. Because it's like they're lazy, they are they want free things, they like he counted everything. So I was now interested, right? Because like instead of like getting pissed off, I was now I want to know more. So he went on, I was like, okay, let's break it down. Do you think I'm lazy? Say, no, 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 you're not. Do you think I'm needy? No, 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 you're not. Um, do you think I'm this, I'm that, I'm that? I was like, so how is that school of thought different from me? Because I'm a Christian. I'm a Christian. And that's when also he learned something. Because mm -hmm. the, the interaction of Christian that he has had perhaps might have been the ones he labeled. But it never took time to look at them as people, as persons. So now here he is over a beer in the bar, literally over a beer, and we're sipping, we're drinking. And, and, and you know, we even said he was like, "No, you're not a Christian." I was like, "What do you mean? <laughs> what is your ideal Christianity?" Right? <laughs> that was such a very beautiful conversation, and for me, that's where my my thinking has evolved. Um, and sometimes when, uh, when, when, you know, I'm having a conversation, somebody has completely opposite point of view. 
I respectfully empathize without putting any judgment or imposing my own thinking. And for me, I actually prefer us to have more dialogue on those areas than just take it in face value. And if we can't see anything in a common or in commonality, I still respect it because that is their point of view. So that's how like the whole um, faith and belief has, you know, have transitioned. I've just given the rough overview. Um, yeah, that's where I am right now. More empathetic, more compassionate, <laughs> and more understanding. Well, that that's really good, and and uh, thank you for walking it through from from where it started to where it is now. Uh, and and there's quite a few things in there that you've touched on that really uh, I appreciate because um, there's a, a a Canadian professor whose work I follow, and uh, Professor John Vaveki. So he did this uh, fifty episode. Um, Siri on the meaning crisis, and he's done a few other series after that. But in that specific one, uh, he gets to a place where he's speaking about, you know, uh, the sages and, you know, people like Jesus, uh, Buddha, and all the like. Yeah. And particularly when he's talking about Jesus, he says something interesting. He said, when Jesus started out his mission, it's like what this guy did was he he tried to go and um and practice what they called agape love which is uh a giving of his personhood to another person uh so that they can sort of like almost you know just you know by osmosis sort of become like him almost right yeah. and so at the time in uh you know the the roman empire you would um if you are not a person fit to live in the city, you'd, yeah. you'd get kicked out. And so you'd yeah. have to go live in the slums outside of the city. Yeah. And so there was a lot of people who had been cast out of the city. And what does this guy do? Uh, once he's ready for his mission, he heads out to the outcasts yeah. and he starts to live with them. Like, you know, everyday life. Uh, just stays with them, lives with them. And in the process of doing that, uh, he starts to sort of like show them a better way of living under their current circumstances. And it started to rub off and they started to see that. And before you know it, he has this whole movement and you know, thousands of years later, here we are still talking about that and sort of like trying to learn as much as we can from that. And yeah. so... You know, going back to the person, it's like it—it it is. It—it's really you should like you have to aspire to see the person before what is before you sort of blocks your vision to yeah. to not see them. Like you know, for example, like you, you, you're a parent, you see this with the children, right? Like, and you you spoke about this with the with the photos, right? Like yeah. when you see when you look back at the photos you see the difference in terms yeah. of like how they have grown all to this point, right? Because you can, you, you have the reference point, you have the reference data to, to tell the difference. But in your experience of this child, they have never really looked different, <laughs> right? It's like you, you always saw that person right from when they were little and th- that person has sort of like compounded and maybe the, 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 you'd say the resolution of the person has sort of like become more and more fine. Um, but to you, they were always, it's like, what do you mean? I, I always saw them this way. Like I always believed they were going to become this. And I always felt like they had that potential, even at that time when they look like they couldn't even feed themselves or do anything yeah. for themselves. I yeah. was able to see that. And yeah. I think it's, it's having that orientation where you look at the person as opposed to, you know, the label and what yeah. they might seem looking like. So, yeah. yeah, yeah. And, and, and I think that's, that is the, like, that's the journey we all have to walk and, and sort of like go through as well. As a parent, you get the privilege of, of having to see that with your children. But I think when you start to see people in this way, then now you you develop the respect for them 
now you can have the dialogue. Now, and once you start having the dialogue, now you can learn from their perspective and start to see how they are seeing. And everything that did not make sense starts to sort of like make sense. Like the, the thing which you'd go off the top of your head and go, like, that's wrong. Now that you understand the the broader context, yeah. then you go all of a sudden, it's like, oh, I don't, I don't think it's wrong anymore. I just, I just yeah. had not understood it properly. It yeah. 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 It's like, I, I was giving an example of this, um, like, uh, you know, w- w- with my wife, it's like we, we used to have these unnecessary head bashings, right? Like you conflict, you conflict after conflict and you sulk and then you don't talk for days. Then another conflict emerges, then you have to battle over it. And every time you, you conflict, then you bring back the history. It's like, and remember the, the other time and the other time and the other time. And you've always done this. Uh, but lucky for me, I had this opportune moment one time where I took a step back and I went like, wait, it can't be that, you know, she's wrong, right? Yeah. Because when, when you're painting the bigger picture, like she has been with me for so many years, we have children together. Uh, it seems like she cares about me, right? And so if she's saying something, maybe I'm not understanding it, right? And so like, what if I try to understand, right? And take yeah. a step back and yeah. stop assuming that, uh, like I'm fully understanding from the snippet that I think I had. And so, you know, trying to paint in the extra context of like, oh, wait, where's the conversation happening, right? So, okay, maybe the conversation is happening in a kitchen. What's going on? Or, oh, well, yeah. there's, it's loud. There's a, there's a radio playing. There's, you know, things cooking. There's fire involved. There's children running around. All these are pieces of, you know, interference in the communication, right? Like, like all that context has to be a- accounted for. And then let's say maybe she's explaining something and she's not as articulate as I was expecting her to be. Uh, instead of critiquing and going like, no, you're wrong in all these ways. That's not the right word to use. If I can go past that and just try to understand what she's trying to mean, then maybe I may I may meet her at at where she is and I may understand what she's trying to say without being trapped in the language. Yeah. And and you know this thing back home where you you you, you call a petrol station by a brand name or use like toothpaste you call it by a brand name and and so yeah. I would get trapped in those things like well, is it this or is it that because like I want it to be very yeah. logically definite but yeah. but this is uh it's a struggle like you know language is a difficult tool to use and so yes. learning to go past that limitation and starting to hear the meaning of what is on display in the dialogue quickly changes, transforms the whole thing, which is, which is the empathy you're talking about, right? Like, so now listening with that empathy and playing back what you're hearing, all of a sudden removes like a whole range of unnecessary conflicts. Now you get yeah. to, the, of course, the, there will still be conflicts, but there'll be the important ones whereby it's more like a, a mistake or just something that missing data that you need to kind of like put in together. And so yeah. now the conflict stopped being a problem where you bash your heads and they started to be an opportunity to yeah. actually learn more from each other and yeah. grow kind of like what you're describing with the, you know, with this person in part as go oh, wait. So you're Christians like, yeah, it's like, okay, now it seems I have to go back and redefine what yeah. I mean uh, or how yeah. I understand Christian. And I think, walking that journey it can almost be like a lifelong journey and uh yeah wow thank, thank you for sharing that <laughs> you know as you're as you're speaking um i think one of the things that i learned through my faith journey is that the even though we are we are drawing from the same source let's say we're drawing from the bible right the interpretation who we are not paying attention to the difference in the interpretation of the same text. Mm. Because you, we can read the same, but then we analyze it completely different. It doesn't mean you are wrong or I'm right or I'm right or you're wrong. It's like seeing that perspective. In fact, now that I think of it as you are speaking, I'm rewinding 
to realize that my mind exposure did not just start in the uni. It actually started way before uni, and I will tell you why. So, because I was exposed to different, you know, denominations. As a Roman Catholic, I went to the Church of England, which they call Anglican. I, I went to Pentecostal. And then, of course, within the Pentecostal, you have like a variety, right? But there was one, I was a kid, I remember this moment very, very clearly. It was um, what they call a crusade. This crusade is, there were, um, I think, a bunch of five to six, seven-day Adventists who came to our village. And they gathered everybody in the village. For the very first time, for the very, and I remember this very clearly, it's like yesterday. After they preached, they talk about the Christ, they read from the text, then they, they ask people to ask questions. I remember this very well. So, and we're not used to it. We're like, who are these guys? Why are they asking us to ask questions? We shouldn't be asking questions. You should be telling us what to do and we should believe it. We're like, yeah, you ask. So, the whole crusade became a dialogue. To some, it escalated into argument. Because there were some staunch ones who believed that you don't ask questions. So nobody understood each other until now. I'm understanding that like their point of view is like, I've told you, what do you think? What do you think? Maybe I'm not seeing something like it was such... I was very quiet. I didn't ask any question. I was a kid, of course. I was not supposed to speak. But that moment maybe started something that I did not know evolve. Mm. The, the, the understanding that, yeah, we, we can talk about the same subject, but how do you analyze it? How do you interpret it? And the other thing that as we were talking of, um, um, I realized that throughout the Bible, if you especially G Jesus' interactions. There were interactions that were either based on parables, which is a storytelling. And if not anything, probably maybe more than half of the things that he said, I remember them in the form of a parable. Mm -hmm. So that was a whole different way of passing down the information. You know, and it sticks, right? But the other thing is, most of his answers were in form of questions. Right? <laughs> Most of his answers were in form of questions. Somebody stands up and asks him a question, then he would answer back with a question. And that, at, at, you know, at the time, I, I didn't understand it. I was like, why is he answering with questions? But as my mind evolved and I started understanding a little bit better by being in the background, by reflecting, by removing myself from the vibes, I realized that. Even though he is supreme, he still wanted you to exude your human understanding. He wanted it to come from you. Want, like that kind of proactive approach where he does something, then he asks you to react to it. For me, that was a very brilliant, really a very brilliant way of engaging us to understand. Um, and then the other one was, of course, Paul. I told one of the characters that I really, really up to date. I really love reading about him was Paul. Paul had a different perspective of how to um, to share the gospel. Um, in most cases, he would also engage you in a dialogue. And, you know, it, it doesn't matter whether you, you are from this culture or from the other culture. So he would try and associate himself to understand your point of view much more closely by sitting down to dialogue. And I think for me, that also really um, opened my eyes at young age where well, I was reading, you know, more about Paul, his journey, and how he transitioned from being a murderer to now a champion of Christ and so on. That also opened my eyes to some level, but I started understanding all this when my brain started developing, now mm. articulating and realizing certain things um, done differently. So a person, coming back to the person, um, if we have a preconceived idea of how we think things work, it doesn't necessarily mean the other person sees it the other way. Yeah. If only we had empathy to understand their point of view, 
maybe we would have a much more meaningful conversation, you know, instead of arguing and telling them this is the only way, this is how you do it, you know, no way, nothing else. Um, it's, it's fascinating. Yeah, it, it totally is. And, and I think that brings us back to where we almost started, you know, like everybody has their own wisdom, right? Yeah. I, and, and I think that's, it's like the moment you try to put it in a box, then that's when you, you miss the point of it. That's when you fail to actually see it because you've now labeled it with this assumption of what it only is, and which is, a, was it the curse of knowledge, right? Like yeah. that, that injunction in Genesis about eating, uh, do not eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil because then yeah. you will die. Like literally, yeah. like if, if, you, if, if you try to see the world just in, in terms of like good or bad, yeah. It quickly, like all the mystery sort of like quickly dies away. And then all of a sudden you're only looking at just those two aspects of it, but it's much, much richer than that. And especially now when you apply that to people trying to find out is, is are they a good person? Or are they a bad person? What should I do with them? You quickly miss what is right before you. And yeah. so, yeah, I really think we really need to start doing that more often and 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 your suggestion of uh doing that through dialogue i think it's it's the most up and I mean, like even doing this podcast is like it's all about yeah let's just have a dialogue let's see where yeah. it goes and yeah. yeah wow and look we've been speaking for over an hour now <laughs> yeah. yeah the appreciation that we are all created different and we have all had different experiences um either growing up or in our journey it should be there. We should. We need to appreciate that. We need to celebrate that. Um, yeah. You know, I've I have encountered conversations that could have gone south, but because I was so inquisitive, I just want to know more. You know, I remember my first time in Australia. Um, a manager told me that. But you're from Africa, right? I was like, yes. How come you're very good? See, that for me is, you can take it like as an insult, or you could take it as a point of education. So I paused for like a fraction of a second. I was like, hmm, thank you. Thank you. However, let's first talk about it more. When, when, when you perceive somebody from Africa, like what, what kind of preconceived notion do you have, mm. right? That ended up into like a two hour knowledge sharing and understanding that could have escalated. Could, I could have gone on defensive and say, so you think nobody's good from Africa or whatever? No. So it was such also a very good conversation because he got to learn heaps of things that he didn't know. I got to learn heaps of, you know, where he was coming from, his thinking, his upbringing that I didn't know. So um, that, that level of empathy and dialogue, I think the world needs more of that. You and I have, have always spoken that, you know, you, the world is okay. The world is the way it is, you know. <laughs> so you don't try to claim you're going to change it. Like, However, when you have a conversation and dialogue, I think for me that is more meaningful than you trying to save everybody, you know. Mm. So, and I respect, I respect whoever thinks otherwise, you know, because that's their passion. That's what they want to do. I respect that. Uh, but what has worked so well for me, and I want to just make sure that is clear, is I prefer to have dialogue than being confrontational, you know. Mm. Yeah. Mm. No, that was beautifully said. And uh, yeah, like I don't even have anything more to add to that. Uh, we'll, we'll try and wrap it up for now and we'll probably have to do a few more, more of these in the future. Um, just before we do that, uh, did you have some of the things, you have many ventures that are running that you, would you like to share about some of those? And we can always include some of those links uh, in the description. Yeah. Well, um... I definitely, the thing that I would like to shine more light on is um, 
some of the passionate projects that I'm working on around with creatives in Africa and other developing world. Um, I do executive produce um, to some extent, also do funding for different creative projects, like especially music, to some extent film. Part of which is um, I want to first and foremost also appreciate that uh, I'm in a position where I can help the best I can. So um, Colossal Dream Entertainment is where um, I am involved, is mostly working with um, music, working with other creatives, um, podcasts, and an opportunity to let somebody learn. Of recent, of course, I've started um, rolling out different series around artificial intelligence because I use it on the daily, um, you know, and that is something going on. I will share with you some of the links to, to this. But above all, I'm, I'm really excited for you to host me. Um, I don't take this for granted. It's, it's always good that we share our hearts. Um, we don't have control on how somebody's going to take it, but at least we have control on what we say. So um, thank you for having me. And I hope somebody out there will benefit from this um, and then carry on the torch. Yeah, thank you. Well, thanks so much. It's been a pleasure having you. Pleasure, man. Thank you, Clayton. Bye.